Praise God. All right, it's good to see you, everybody. God bless you. I love you, and I'm glad to be with you here talking about the things of God again. And uh, wow, what a glorious day in Jesus Christ. And today, you know, as we continue in the history around the time of Jesus, from the time he's crucified, to those things he told us would happen in that generation, how Jerusalem and the temple would totally be destroyed, not one stone on another there, and the things that were coming about. We just look at this contrast of the things that we're seeing, and the contrast that I'm seeing here is such a contrast in the temple of God. You're going from a bloody, defiled, desolate temple to one that is cleansed and has life abundantly to one that can endure last throughout eternity the other one is sick and defiled they needed a healer they needed healing from their backsliding and praise god the peace of jerusalem that they were told by david to pray for came jesus christ the prince of peace so that they could have peace and of course his apostles these other jewish men see i'm going by what jewish men taught that were filled with the holy spirit following jesus the christ the messiah who moses and the prophets spoke about i mean this is true prophecy jesus christ and of course jesus christ if you've seen me you've seen the father he is the one speaking to Moses and the prophets. He is the one there on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, John, and James fall to the ground when they're wanting to build a tabernacle for Moses and Jesus. But what does God say? Boom! This is my son. Hear him. It's Jesus Christ that we need to hear. Just like Joshua went from Moses to Joshua, went from Moses to Jesus from the Aaronic priesthood to this priesthood of Melchizedek with no beginning, no end, this lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus Christ. So what we're going to look at in the Jewish War, Book 4, B, uh, the Idumean robbers, mad murdering zealots, and then this blood flowing from a defiled temple. We'll be looking at cruelty of Idumeans entering Jerusalem and the temple during that storm. We talked about how they entered last time. And that slaughter of Ananus, we talked about him. Remember that uh, fifth priest of Annas, fifth son, that was a high priest that killed James, the brother of Jesus that wrote the book of James. Then there's this Jesus, an older priest that was on the wall when the Idumeans were trying to get in. And then there's Zacharias and others that are being killed and murdered at the temple until it's defiled with blood. And so you, then you'll see these Idumeans repenting of what they had done and unexpectedly leave. It gives the zealots freedom to be more cruel than they had been before. Now this first part, uh, I'll just synopsize it for you. The zealots during the cover of storm and earthquake, they sawed through the gate to open it for entry of the Idumeans. And the Idumeans had been lied to by the zealots saying the priests and others were traitors to Rome. And so they ascend through Jerusalem into the city and to the temple and that's where they kill a bunch of guards right there. And then the whole multitude, they arise realizing that the Idumeans had entered. And then here you see see and hear the shouts of the zealots, the Idumeans, the priests, and those are the, that are with the priests in their fighting and all of the stuff that's going on. And then you're hearing this great howling of the women as all the guards were in danger of being killed. And so you can think about that. Here you're a wife taking care of children and all of this destruction and death is coming into your place where you can be basically left at the mercy of anybody because you don't have a husband to help and you got to take care of the kids and do all these things which takes 
basically a full-time job just doing those things. So, uh, so anyway, all this fighting, nobody is spared. So let's get into just reading this of Josephus, Jewish War, Book 4, Chapter 5, Section 1. We see heaps of bodies, a temple overflowing with blood. Many jumped to their own deaths, insomuch that they ran through those with their swords, who desired them to remember the relation there was between them, and begged them to have regard to their common temple. So see, here you had the ones that were basically sided with the priests in Jerusalem. You had zealots, uh, and you had Idumeans. They're all Jews. This temple is all part of their heritage and the city, Jerusalem, for those things. And so they're begging with their brothers uh, to stop doing this. They have a common regard to their temple, but still they go on with killing. Now there was at present neither any place for flight nor any hope of preservation. But as they were driven one upon another in heaps, so were they slain. Thus the great part were driven together by force, and there was now no place of retirement. And the murderers were upon them, and having no other way, threw themselves down headlong into the city. Whereby, in my opinion, they underwent a more miserable destruction than that which they avoided, because that was a voluntary one. And now the outer temple was all of it, overflowed with blood. And that day, as it came on, they saw 8,500 dead bodies there. So you think of this blood, this defiling of the temple, and it's just flowing out of that temple. See, we have Jesus Christ, who He died once for us. So we don't have to continue. God had no pleasure in those sacrifices. But men of the world, they had turned from him and they were doing their own sacrifices in the world. And God gave this as something showing him, showing people, showing us that he would do it to wipe away our sins, to show mercy on us. But here we have people that have no mercy. All right, section two. The idea man slaughter, standing on dead bodies and just plundering every house. Rage of the Idumeans was not satiated by these slaughters, but they now betook themselves to the city and plundered every house, and slew every one they met. They sought for the high priests, and the generality went with the greatest zeal against them. And as soon as they caught them, they slew them, and then standing upon their dead bodies in way of jest, upbraided Ananus with his kindness to the people, and Jesus with his speech made to them from the wall. Remember this older priest, Jesus, who had given a speech to these Idumeans, forbidding them entry into the city, and tried to explain to them what was right, but they wouldn't listen. Nay, they proceeded to that degree of impiety as to cast away their dead bodies without burial. Although the Jews used to take so much care of the burial of men that they took down those that were condemned and crucified, and buried them before the going down of the sun. I should not mistake if I said that the death of Ananus was the beginning of the destruction of the city, and that from this very day may be dated the overthrow of her wall and the ruin of her affairs, whereon they saw their high priest and the procurer of their preservation slain in the midst of their city. Well, here, Ananus, the fifth son of Annas, that's where Jesus was taken first to Annas, the father of Ananus, then to his son-in-law Caiaphas, who was a high priest at the time of Jesus. But Ananus is his fifth son that had become a high priest. And with all the things going on, Ananus looks like a pretty, pretty decent guy compared to all of this other stuff that's going on even though him, he himself was a murderer. His father is rejected Jesus Christ, wanted a murder robber. They said, crucify him. He, we have no king but Caesar. Let his blood be on us and our children's head. Well, now we have Ananus, Ananus' child, and blood is going on his head. 
Now he's the one who murdered James. We can look at Jewish Antiquities book 20 chapter 9 to look at that paragraph where Ananus during the time of Albinus. Now I try to do uh, teachings so we can remember some of this stuff but remember Felix comes before Festus and he was married to Drusilla. Then we have A and B. Agrippa and Bernice and then we start over at A. Albinus. But Albinus is the Roman pro procurator during the time when Ananus killed James and some of his companions. So killing Christians, fellow Jews that are walking in peace, doing nothing, not being bribed, but speaking what is right, warning them of judgment to come and the life that they can have through Jesus Christ. But they don't want the witness of Jesus Christ. We have murders of high priests, Jesus and Ananus, and we see that they are food of dogs and wild beasts, and they are doomed by God. He was thoroughly sensible the Romans were not to be conquered. Also foresaw that unless the Jews made up matters with them very dexterously, they would be destroyed. If Ananus had survived, they had certainly compounded matters had already gotten the mastery of those that opposed his design or were for war. Jews had then put abundance of delays in the way of Romans if they had had such a general as he. Jesus also joined with him, although he was inferior to him upon the comparison, he was superior to the rest. So that's that Jesus, the another priest that had been on the wall there. I cannot think that it was because God had doomed this city to destruction as a polluted city and was resolved to purge his sanctuary by fire that he cut off these their great defenders and well-wishers while those that a little before had worn the sacred garments and had presided over the public worship and had been esteemed venerable by those that dwelt on the whole habitable earth when they came into our city were cast out naked and seen to be the food of dogs and wild beasts I cannot but imagine that virtue itself groaned at these men's case and lamented that she was here so terribly conquered by wickedness. This at last was the end of Ananus and Jesus. Josephus wrote this very quickly because we see that this is already in Rome written by around 75 AD and the fall is at 70 AD. So this is very quickly written and so Jesus Josephus could see that this was God's doing that brought a destruction, a cleansing of this temple because it was wicked and it, it was deemed to be taken down for its wickedness. So it's such a contrast in the temple that God was doing. All right, let's move on to section three. We have zealots and Idumeans fell on people of Jerusalem like profane animals. Zealots and Idumeans fell upon the people as upon a flock of profane animals, cut their throats. Noblemen in youth, they first caught them and bound them and shut them up in prison in hopes that some of them would turn over to their party, but not one of them would comply with their desires. But all of them preferred death before being enrolled among such wicked wretches as acted against their own country. This refusal brought upon them terrible torments, for they were so scourged and tortured, till at length and with difficulty they had the favor to be slain. Those they caught in the daytime were slain in the night. Then their bodies were carried out and thrown away, that there might be room for other prisoners, and terror on the people was so great, no one had courage enough to weep openly for the dead man related to him, or to bury him. But those that were shut up in their own houses could only shed tears in secret, and not even groan without great caution, lest any of their enemies should hear them. For if they did, those that mourned for others soon underwent the same death with those whom they mourned for. Only in the night time they would take up a little dust and throw it upon their bodies. Twelve thousand perished in this manner. So you can see something. In the natural, these men are trying to do what is naturally good. 
Now, see, there's a, a, also a contrast between what is naturally good and what is spiritually good. See, they were blind to seeing what God was bringing by the Spirit. They were deaf to hearing what God was bringing by the Spirit. They should have been there speaking for what is right, bringing more people towards God, but they were actually blocking people going towards God. And so, in the natural, that's where they were. And it looked maybe for them like naturally they're doing something good. But spiritually, they were still doing things that were still evil because they were against Jesus Christ and what happens to them. Look, it's just like this water right here. This water is great, but it is not what it's going to take for life eternal, for love eternal. It's good for a short time, but God does not mean for this system to operate forever. No, it's sinful, it's fallen, it's short, it misses the mark. The only one who makes the mark is Jesus Christ who is without sin, that lamb that was slain for us. Praise God, seven eyes and seven horns, all power, all seeing. He is the servant who suffered for us. No, the suffering servant is not physical people. It's not a generic people, a genetic people is it it is jesus christ because those that were natural are blind and deaf the only one who is not blind and deaf who can be a witness is jesus christ risen for us now i'll synopsize another area here where we have the zealots and idumeans they set up fictitious tribunals with false accusations so what happened here is the zealots and the idumeans they set up fictitious courts with 70 judges to try Zacharias. Now, why did they try Zacharias? He was a man there uh, in Jerusalem. It's because he hated wickedness and he loved freedom. And he was rich and they had a plan to seize his wealth. So, how to seize his wealth? Well, kill him. Zacharias is accused of betraying Jews to the Romans and Zacharias is judged innocent. Wow, so at least the 70, at least they did what was right by judging him innocent. But what did the Idumeans and the Zealots do anyway? They slayed him in the middle of the temple and they threw his body out to the valley beneath. And then they beat the judges and they throw them out. All right, and then what happens after that is, amazingly, the Idumeans, because they later had one of the Zealots tell them that this was false, that the uh, priests and those that, that sided with the priests, that they were traitors to the Romans. And so once the Idumeans hear that, they repented of the things they did. They free 2,000 captives that they had put in prisons in Jerusalem. Remember, they had been putting them in prison, torturing and killing them. So anyway, what they do is they decide to leave Jerusalem and then they run to Simon. And we're going to talk about Simon in the next video. But then uh, what do they do? Well, the zealots, the zealots grow more proud and insolent. So this insolent, what that means is being proud and a domineering in power. So now they're left free after all the Idumeans did all this work for them of getting them power over the people that were sided with the Jews. Now they have power, but the thing is, what do they do with their power? They're free to act more wickedly than before. Because I always thought about this too. I always thought, you know, if we ever get in times where uh, people like Jesus, Peter, Paul, John, James, Stephen, the woman being drugged, the woman who's crying at Jesus' feet and washing his feet and kissing her, his feet, wiping him with her hair. If we ever get a time again when these Jews that are rebellious towards God, when they have a huge amount of power, they're not going to act any different. People of the world do the same thing. 
you know, all of us have ancestors throughout the world that were doing crazy stuff. I mean, I got some, you know, the Aztecs, they made their own temples. Here they are capturing other Indians, uh, you know, brothers and sisters and taking them to sacrifice and eating their bodies. No, that's crazy, isn't it? All right, let's go on and read uh, book four, chapter six, verse one. So we see the Jewish zealots secure in killing good men. The zealots grew more insolent, not as deserted by their confederates, but as freed from such men as might hinder their designs and put some stop to their wickedness. Accordingly, they made no longer any delay, nor took any deliberation in their enormous practices, but made use of the shortest method for all their executions and what they had once resolved upon. They put in practice sooner than anyone could imagine. But their thirst was chiefly after the blood of valiant men and men of good families, the one sort of which they destroyed out of envy, the other out of fear. For they thought their whole security lay in leaving no potent men alive. So think about that. That power wants no rivals. No, the ones of the world had a power that they were going to. They want no rival. That's why the witness of Jesus Christ is so fiercely come against and persecuted. But praise God. God has overcome the world through Jesus Christ to set us free. And so you and Jesus Christ are sons of God. And He is looking out for you. And He gave Paul the ability to go to Rome to be a witness. He was a witness before them in Jerusalem. Peter was. Stephen was. And He carried them faithfully to the end. And God is faithful. He will carry us faithful to the end. All right, let's see what we have here. Vespasian sees God as a general giving victory over the Jews who are mad, murdering one another. Commanders of the Romans deemed this sedition among their enemies great advantage to them and were very earnest to march to the city. They urged Vespasian as their lord and general in all cases to make haste and said to him that the providence of God is on our side by setting our enemies at variance against one another that still the change in such cases may be sudden, the Jews may quickly be at one again, either because they may be tired out with their civil miseries or repent them of such doings. But Vespasian replied that they were greatly mistaken in what they thought fit to be done, as those that upon the theater love to make a show of their hands and of their weapons, but do it at their own hazard without considering what was for their advantage and for their security, for that if they now go and attack the city immediately, they shall but occasion their enemies to unite together, and shall convert their force. Now it is in its heights against themselves, but if they stay a while, they shall have fewer enemies, because they will be consumed in this sedition. That God acts as a general of the Romans better than he can do, and is giving the Jews up to them without any pains of their own, and granting their army a victory without any danger that therefore it is their best way, while their enemies are destroying each other with their own hands, falling into the greatest of misfortunes, which is that of sedition, to sit still as spectators of the dangers they run into, rather than to fight hand to hand with men that love murdering, and are mad one against another." Wow, now look at this, how sensible Vespasian is. And here, Vespasian is no newbie. He had been fighting in Britain before, before all of this took place. He was very victoriously, he knew how to measure things precisely for warfare. And we see what a great general he is and the bravery of his son Titus also. Uh, and yeah, this is uh, pretty amazing that he can recognize God's hand. And here he is a pagan. He can recognize God's hand in this. Here Josephus is Jewish. He can recognize God's hand in this. So, and it's amazing how they were trying to give mercy so that there could be peace. But there's something greater going on. I think that's a lot about what a lot of people do in documentaries on Josephus they fail to realize 
how God was working in this design to have Jerusalem taken down for the Jews and for the rest of the world so that people could come together in peace in Jesus Christ for eternity. All right, let's go to section three. We have the zealots guarding the roads out of Jerusalem, killing fellow Jews, escaping as traitors to the Romans. The commanders joined in their approval of what Vespasian had said, and it was soon discovered how wise an opinion he had given. And indeed, many there were of the Jews that deserted every day and fled away from the zealots, although their flight was very difficult, since they had guarded every passage out of the city and slew everyone that was caught at them, as taking it for granted that they were going over to the Romans. Yet did he who gave them money get clear off, while he only that gave them none was voted a traitor. So the upshot was this, that the rich purchased their flight by money, while none but the poor were slain. Along all the roads also vast numbers of dead bodies lay in heaps. And even many of those that were so zealous in deserting at length chose rather to perish within the city. For the hopes of the burial made death in their own city appear of the two less terrible to them. Here Jews are killing the poorest of Jews and leaving their bodies out not to be buried. When this to their hearts was such a huge thing for them just to be buried. So for hopes that they could even die in their own city and be buried, they had. And you know, Jesus said, if you even give a cup of water to the least of mine, you have done it to me. But these people are coming against the poorest and killing them. They don't care whether you're a father, a mother, a child, they just kill them. All right, at Jerusalem, trampling laws of men, laughing at the laws of God, ridiculing oracles of prophets. In a word, no other gentle passion was so entirely lost among them as mercy. Yeah, think about this mercy. That's what they don't have. Where God, He has mercy and He is faithful. For what were the greatest objects of pity did most of all irritate these wretches? They transferred the rage from the living to those that had been slain, from the dead to the living. Nay, terror was so very great that he who survived called them that were first dead happy. As being at rest already, as did those that were under torture in the prisons, declare that upon this comparison, those that lay unburied were the happiest. These men therefore trampled upon all the laws of men, laughed at the laws of God, and for the oracles of the prophets, they ridiculed them as the tricks of jugglers. Yet did these prophets foretell many things concerning the rewards of virtue and punishment of vice, which when these zealots violated, they occasioned the fulfilling of those very prophecies belonging to their own country. For there was a certain ancient oracle of those men that the city should be taken and the sanctuary burnt by right of war when a sedition should invade the Jews and their own hand should pollute the temple of God. Now while these zealots did not quite disbelieve these predictions, they made themselves the instruments of their accomplishment. Well, there's many instances in the Bible of prophets speaking about destruction that would come on them if they didn't obey, if they didn't follow God. And so they could be a kingdom of priests. They would have this beautiful temple if they didn't despise uh or if they didn't, if they had shame. But of course, these guys don't have shame at all. They continue to, um, no, what are they doing? Trampling on men, trampling on laws of God and making fun of the prophets as empty and just like a circus act or something. All right, now, one of the things, of course, I have looked at and we'll go over Daniel 9 24 through 27 remember that we've got the 70 weeks upon thy people and thy holy city and you have these six things finish transgression make an end of sins make reconciliation for iniquity bring in everlasting righteousness seal up the vision and prophecy anoint the most holy well of course this is Jesus Christ when he came so what do we have within this 70 weeks this is going to be done so within the 70 weeks, that's not taking the last week off and 
having some kind of a gap theory in between, right? No, that's all together that we're going to see the Messiah coming. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score weeks. The street shall be built again in the wall even in troubled times. Well, three score and seven. So we have seven and 62, that equals 69. So we're talking about after this, the 70th, the Messiah is coming. And then after that, three score and two weeks so after that 69th week the messiah shall be cut off but not for himself so who is jesus cut off for not himself he is sinless but he's cut off for me for my sins and everybody in the world who wants to know truth who wants to know life who wants to know the right way to go righteousness in god there is righteousness and there is truth there is right order by Jesus Christ. And God's opened that to us that we can turn to him. Now notice there is no mention of an antichrist here, is there? But a lot of people, because they have a political view that started infiltrating into the churches and politics, you will see. And what basically, I don't like getting into politics. And I don't, I don't advise getting into politics when it comes to the Bible. But I think what has happened is politics began to infiltrate into the church for a political headship of power and a power that wants people's mouths shut as a witness to Jesus Christ and I think that has entered and then Christians think they're going to have this gap theory and then they're going to be checking out and then we're going to have Jews preaching the gospel no Jesus Christ is the righteous witness that suffered for us and he is, his body is witness of him by the Holy Spirit. All right, let's look at this, uh, keep going. So after this Messiah is cutting off and not for himself, but after that you're going to see the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the air... And the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Well, think about that. When did we see Jerusalem and the sanctuary being destroyed? Because that's what we're looking at. I mean, Daniel is really wondering about this stuff coming in. When did we see that? Did we see that 40 years after Jesus in that generation? Just like Jesus showed us, right? Wow. And then 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the middle of the week he shall cause a sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So this elimination of the Levitical priesthood, a new covenant in Jesus Christ, who is our high priest, and you in Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what you are genetically. Because it's not about a small portion of people in a small piece of the world. What does God have? The whole world. All the earth is the Lord's and the inheritance there in it. The fruit is... Amen. Pray for laborers in the field so we can have a harvest to God Almighty, to Jesus Christ. Be the glory, be the harvest in the name of Jesus Christ. Come into the harvest and begin to work for the kingdom of God. Don't be a soldier just for the world. Be a soldier for Jesus Christ. Don't be a farmer just for the world. Be a farmer for Jesus Christ and His kingdom, His vineyard. Don't be an athlete just for the world and strive to the finish line just for the world conquering, for the world glory. Do it for Jesus Christ and His kingdom, for the glory of God. Amen. Praise God. Get in with Him. Follow the chief shepherd, the chief cornerstone. Amen. Praise God. 
Amen. The captain of our salvation, Jesus Christ. All right. Yeah, Matthew 23, 37. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent to thee. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. And it surely was. Des desolate and defiled. So we'll look at this one more time here so we can see what's going on. We see after the 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And after the 62 weeks, that's the 70th. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, we saw that with uh, Titus going into this, the surrounding Jerusalem. The end of it shall be with the flood till the end of the war. Desolations are determined. Well, they were totally desolate and defiled. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Well, think about this, what we see. There is two kingdoms, the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of light, of the devil and God. And Daniel was shown that statue. And at the feet of the statue, right when the Roman Empire came in, that they would be hit with the stone, that that statue would begin to collapse, that that stone would grow to a great mountain, a kingdom without end. And so you're shown the same thing, not only in a statue, but in beasts. And when you look at those beasts, you see a harlot that's sitting on a beast. Well, it has a mouth of a lion, a body of a leopard, feet of a bear, and horns. We see that in the nations of the world. And they said, we have no king but Caesar. Crucify him. Where were they seated? They were seated in the world, not the kingdom of God. They're seated in the flesh and what's natural, not what is in spiritual by Jesus Christ. And what do we have? Jesus said, I know you're sons of Abraham, but you don't follow God. You follow your father, the devil. And what are they doing? They are being deceived with demonic deception that's coming out of the mouth of the dragon the mouth of the beast and the false prophet and did they not get hit with those things in that generation when it went down and if they still got hit with those things how much can the same thing happen to us because they faced a destruction that we can learn from they faced a judgment that we can learn from but we are all going to have a judgment that is not only coming on a localized place, but everything, everything at the coming of the glory of God, where His glory is so intense that the heavens will melt, the earth will be burned and renewed, because God does not mean for love for a short time, but for eternity. He doesn't mean for a fallen world in continued corruption, Year after year after year, he doesn't intend for bloody sacrifices year after year after year, but for peace, righteousness, joy, and the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Luke 19, 43. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embarkment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation Matthew 24 15 therefore when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place whoever reads let him understand then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and we have the same thing in Luke 21 20 but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. And let not those who are in the country enter her. And what did Jesus say? Where the carcass is, that's a dead body. They are dead. They have no life. Spiritually, they're dead. In the flesh, you can have no life except through Jesus Christ. You need the living waters from Jesus Christ that you will not thirst again. But where that carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered. Jerusalem was surrounded by eagles watching 
as Jews were throwing their fellow Jews over the walls until it was stench, until the wild animals were just devouring their bodies. Even Titus held up his hand saying, God, this is not of us. Even though he had to crucify many, and yet he's still saying that to God. All right, let's go back to Book 4, Chapter 7, Section 2. We'll see the Sicarii of Masada. They kill more than 700 women and children in En Gedi. The whole country is desolate. So here we are, Masada. Those that were called Sicarii had taken possession of it formally, but at this time they overran the neighboring countries, aiming only to procure to themselves necessaries. When once they were informed that the Roman army lay still and the Jews were divided between sedition and tyranny, they boldly overtook greater matters, and at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which the Jews celebrate in memory of their deliverance from Egypt, they came down by night, overran a certain small city called En Gedi, and cast them out of the city. As for such as could not run away, being women and children, they slew of them about 700. Afterward, when they had carried everything out of their houses and had seized upon all the fruits that were in a flourishing condition, they brought them into Masada. And indeed, these men laid all the villages that were about the fortress waste and had the whole country desolate, while there came to them every day from all parts, not a few men as corrupt as themselves. At that time, all the other regions of Judea that had hitherto been at rest were in motion by means of the robbers. Sedition and disorder that was in the metropolis had the wicked men that were in the country opportunity to ravage the same. Every one of them had plundered their own villages. They then retired into the desert, and thus did they fall upon the holy places and the cities. Nor was there now any part of Judea that was not in a miserable condition, as well as its most eminent city also. So here we see the whole country is desolate. See, they let lawlessness go within Jerusalem, and the lawlessness just went about like a cancer throughout the whole rest of the country. You know, this is where um, people, they let lawlessness go in cities. They let cities be burnt, uh, destruction without justice. That can lead to like a cancer. Well, what is cancer? It's disorder. Yeah, God can't let a fallen world that's in disorder last forever. It would be just a continual disorder, a cancer. But God means for healing. And the healing that we need is healing from our backsliding, from backing away from God to coming to Him for that hug of Him, for that love of Him who's faithful. But right now we got a job to do. That's to be about the business of God. Be about the things of the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You won't be pulled into the rest of the things of this world because we're meant to be men and women walking faithfully forward in the kingdom of God. All right, let's see what else happened here in section 3, chapter 7. The people of Gadara of Perea under the rebels send for Vespasian's rescue and the rebels flee. Vespasian did indeed already pity the calamities these men were in, and arose in appearance as though he was going to besiege Jerusalem, but in reality to deliver them from a worse siege they were already under. However, he was obliged first to overthrow what remained elsewhere, and to leave nothing out of Jerusalem behind him that might interrupt him in that siege. Accordingly, he marched against Gadara, the metropolis of Perea. For the men of power had sent an embassage to him without the knowledge of the seditious to treat about a surrender, which they did out of the desire that they had of peace. Well, that's great. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus said, didn't he? And for saving their effects because many of the citizens of Gadara were rich men. This embassy the opposite party knew nothing of, but discovered it as Vespasian was approaching near the city. However, they despaired of keeping possession of the city as being inferior in number to their enemies who were within the city, and seeing the Romans very near to the city, so they resolved to fly, but thought it dishonorable to do it without shedding some blood. 
and avenging themselves on the authors of this surrender. So they seized upon Dolius, a person not only the first rank and family in that city, but one that seemed the occasion of sending such an embassy. And they slew him and treated his dead body after a barbarous manner. So very violent was their anger at him, and then they ran out of the city. The people of Gadara admitted Vespasian with joyful acclamations and received from him the security of his right hand as also the garrison of horsemen and footmen to guard them against the excursions of the renegades. For as to the wall, they had pulled it down before the Romans desired them to do so, that they might thereby give them assurance that they were lovers of peace, and that if they had a mind, they could not now make war against them. And then chapter 4, section 4, we see the Jewish rebels of Gadara destroyed at Beth and Baris. Vespasian sent Placidus against those that had fled from Gadara with 500 horsemen and 3,000 footmen while he returned himself to Caesarea with the rest of the army. But as soon as these fugitives saw the horsemen that pursued them just upon their backs and before they came to the close fight, they ran to a certain village, Bethanabras, where finding a great multitude of young men and arming them partly by their own consent, partly by force, they rashly and suddenly assaulted Placidus and the troops that were with him. These horsemen at the first onset gave way a little as contriving to entice them further off the wall. And when they had drawn them into a place fit for their purpose, they made their horse encompass them around and threw their darts at them. So the horsemen cut off the flight of the fugitives while the footmen destroyed those that fought against them. For those Jews did no more than show their courage and then were destroyed. For as they fell upon the Romans, when they were joined close together, and as it were walled about with their entire armor, they were not able to find any place where the darts could enter, nor were there any way able to break their ranks, while they were themselves run through by the Roman darts, and like the wildest of beasts, rushed upon the point of others' swords. So some of them were destroyed, as cut with their enemy's sword upon their faces, and others were dispersed by the horsemen. And next we see Placidus pursues Jews to the Jordan River where there's 15,000 slain. At last the most courageous of them break through those horsemen and fled to the wall of the village. And now those that guarded the wall were in great doubt what to do. For they could not bear the thought of excluding those that came from Gadara because of their own people that were among them. Yet if they should admit them, they expected to perish with them, which came to pass accordingly. For as they were crowding together at the wall, the Roman horsemen were just ready to fall in with them. The guards prevented them and shut the gates. When Placidus made an assault upon them, fighting courageously till it was dark, he got possession of the wall and of the people that were in the city, when the useless multitude were destroyed. But those that were more potent ran away, and soldiers plundered houses and set the village on fire. As for those that ran out of the village, they stirred up such as were in the country and exaggerating their own calamities and telling them that the whole army of the Romans were upon them, put them into a great fear on every side. So they got in great numbers together and fled to Jericho, for they knew no other place that could afford them any hope of escaping, it being a city that had a strong wall and a great multitude of inhabitants. But Placidus followed them and slew all that he overtook as far as the Jordan. They were stopped by the current. They then extended themselves a very great way along the banks of the river and sustained the darts that were thrown at them. Attacks of the horsemen who beat many of them and pushed them into the current. 15,000 of them were slain, while the number of those that were unwillingly forced to leap into the Jordan was great. Besides 2,200 taken prisoners, a mighty prey was taken also, consisting of asses, sheep, camels, and oxen. So what we see is all of this trouble, this rebellion that had poured out of Jerusalem from the metropolis to the countryside and going out east into Perea and all these other places. And we see the rebellions where the Romans are putting down all these other rebellions until they can get those down, until they can surround Jerusalem. But what we see is a country filled with slaughter. The Jordan and the Dead Sea are filled with dead bodies. This destruction that fell upon the Jews, as it was not inferior to any of the rest in itself, so did it still appear greater than it really was. And this, because not only the whole country through which they fled was filled with slaughter, and Jordan could not be passed over by reason of the dead bodies that were in it, 
but because the Lake Asphaltesis, or the Dead Sea, was also full of dead bodies that were carried down into it by the river, Placidus, after this good success that he had, fell violently upon the neighboring smaller cities and villages when he took Abila, Julius, Bezimoth, and all of those as far as Lake Asphaltetes, and put such of the deserters into each of them as he thought proper. He then put soldiers on board ships and slew such as had fled to the lake, insomuch that all Perea had either surrendered themselves or were taken by the Romans as far as Machaerus. And you see that on the lower right hand side there. All of this stuff and then all of this blood even on ships. So remember all the battles that we saw in Galilee along the shores where the horses are in there. You can imagine these horses sweating and what are they going to do? You know after battles they're going to roll in the ground on bloody ground these horses are rolling their bridles are bloody from rolling on the ground and bloody from before that when they're in the water stabbing and fighting then the shores are bloody so that's just more and more blood that we see as the rebellion is being put down until they can get to Jerusalem but what I, I see is this contrast between the temple and so we got to look at see what was God's plan with that temple see a friend of God Abraham Abraham was looking forward to a city not built by hands but he was looking for something that God was building building it's by faith Abraham was not a Jew Isaac Jacob and then you have 12 sons one of them is Judah so it's amazing how God takes one man out of the world. He brings a family from the woman, from Abraham, from David, that seed that is coming, Jesus Christ. So you see one temple that you're going to choose and go back to one that's bloody, one that's defiled, one that's earthly, one that's of the flesh, or are you going to do one that's pleasing to God? One that God has cleansed because you in Jesus Christ are precious to Him. Precious stones built on that chief cornerstone. Built to be the kingdom of God, the temple of God, the city of God, Jerusalem above that's set free. Not the one here. The one here is in slavery. They need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ to be set free. It's not about worldly things. I could tell you worldly things. Oprah can tell you worldly things. She can do some good things. She could give you a, she could give a water like this to many different cities. But God has men and women speaking the truth by the power of the Holy Spirit. So you can choose life in Jesus Christ. Well, let's look at the temple. Uh, just a couple of scriptures we can look on this. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 3.14 and 2 Corinthians 6.14. If anyone's work he has built on, if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Well, see, there's work to be done. Are you building it with men and women that are going to stay faithful to Jesus Christ? Or are they going to go back to the worldly? Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. Well, they defiled the temple of God. They became destroyed. We could learn from that, couldn't we? For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And let's look at 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has a temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said... 
I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And we see that with Moses in Leviticus 26, 12. We see it with the prophets, with Jeremiah 32, 38, with Ezekiel 37, 27. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you and ye shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And again, we see that in the prophets. Isaiah 52, 11, Ezekiel 20, 34 and 41 and 2 Samuel 7, 14. Praise God. Jesus has spoken through Moses, through the prophets, to me by His Holy Spirit. He opened my ears. He opened my eyes. Praise God. I pray that my Jewish friends, my Muslim friends, my pagan friends, um, my friends of the world and family that are out there, that your eyes would be opened, that your ears would be opened to hear the truth, to receive life and life more abundantly in Jesus Christ. You don't have to turn to another man, but turn to Jesus who laid it all down for you so our sins could be wiped out. The one who didn't sin, the lamb that was slain for us, who was risen, Jesus Christ, to bring you life. Just like that woman at the well, she went and told the whole town. She began to work for harvest in the kingdom of God. Wow, that is so exciting. Praise God. Be about the things of the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Praise God. I pray that God will gift you with the ministries that He has for you within the kingdom of God. For all the gifts that God has in His body, in His kingdom, that is so counter to the things of the world. For His temple that is so counter to those temples of the world that you would have life in Him. Because when He comes back, he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter the joy of the Lord. I love you. In the name of Jesus. En el nombre de Jesucristo.